So it may come as a big surprise to some of you that I, in fact, am a huge fan of zombies. I know that zombie media is something that many consider to be oversaturated nowadays, and I can't exactly disagree, but there's something so simple and enjoyable about it to me that I can't help but have a good time with it. Now when I say zombie media, I'm sure that the majority of you who know what I typically talk about on this channel would assume that I'm referring to zombie games which would be a fair assumption considering some of my favorite franchises, but contrary to what you may assume, zombie movies are what I love the most. Ever since I was a kid, I have been obsessed with watching whatever zombie films I could get my hands on. Most of my favorite franchises of all time are either completely about zombies or are zombie adjacent. I just can't get enough of them. And it was shortly after making these zombie Clyde sprites for my RE3 video that I started thinking about zombie films again, wondering if there was potential for me to talk about my love of them to you guys. And that's when I had the idea for today's video. I could go on for hours about zombie movies I love already, but what about the ones I've never seen before? The obscure movies, the ones that nobody really talks about. I was itching to experience some new zombie movies already, and the prospect of finding some new, ridiculous films that I could talk about for the sake of a video sounded way too fun for me to pass up. So that's what I did for today's video. I went hunting, searching wherever I could on the internet to find the most obscure, schlocky zombie movies I could find. And once I found them, I watched them alongside my poor, unfortunate friends who were kind enough to sit through the majority of them with me. And after watching all of them, I feel like words cannot describe the ridiculous nature of what we all witnessed. These movies ranged from odd in certain places to downright insanity. They were absurd. Some of these movies I could barely even grasp what was going on, making for one of the most enjoyable yet confusing watch parties I have ever been a part of. In this video, we're going to go over all of them, discussing these films in order of least to most absurd, talking about what they were all about, and giving my thoughts at the end about them. I hope you're ready for a wild time because some of these movies are so insane it's hard to describe. So without further ado, let's delve into it. Out of all the films we watched on this marathon, Flesh Eater was without a doubt the most generic and formulaic one, which actually caught me by surprise. The reason I even wanted to watch this one was because of the interesting behind the scenes the movie had, which made it seem like it was going to offer a lot more than it actually did. The film was written, directed, produced by, and even starred Bill Hinsman, who you may recognize as being the cemetery zombie in Night of the Living Dead. Pair this with the fact that the film was literally named after one of the working titles for that same movie, and you have something which I expected to be a love letter to that film's legacy and zombie movies in general. What we ended up getting instead, though, was something very basic and uninspired. It had its moments, which you'll definitely see once we get into it, but even compared to some of the other films we'll be talking about today, I was just left disappointed by this one. Not to say that this was necessarily a terrible movie, it just left a lot to be desired. Flesh Eater begins as we see a group of college students on a hayride, making their way towards the most barren forest I have ever seen for a camping trip. They get dropped off there, begin participating in all the activities that horny college students in an 80s horror film do, and while they're up to that, we cut to a farm worker who's seen pulling down a tree stump, uncovering the grave of the movie's titular villain, the Flesh Eater. Oh no, is this the burial ground of the Flesh Eater? Oh no! Oh, there's like a pentagram there. My property again. Goddamn college kids leaving the goddamn slabs of the devil. Where the fuck does this take place? <laughs> the goddamn Minnesota is my slabs. guess. The goddamn slabs of the devil. <laughs> what a line. <laughs> Wow, that lock had, like, no resistance. It's in the ground, it'll be fine. This dude's like the lock-picking lawyer! Oh, he... Oh, that coffin... Oh, I thought the coffin was already empty. 
<laughs> ah. From here on, the movie goes exactly where you would expect, with different characters going off on their own to do whatever the hell, and eventually encountering zombies, being killed, rinse and repeat. This cycle goes on for a bit in the forest until eventually the group of college students who are still alive realize what's going on and make their way to a small cabin to hide away. They attempt to board themselves inside the cabin, grabbing onto whatever weapons they can find and hammering planks into the wall so incompetently that it made my poor friend Gaming Age absolutely livid. This is like um, that one um, scene um, from The Walking Dead game. That dude needs to learn how to fucking use a hammer, holy shit. He did not need that many fucking taps to board up that door. What the? Oh my god. True, yeah, actually. My god, you so. AJ, okay, AJ, uh, calm down. <laughs> not all of us are men from the south. We don't We don't know these things. That dude's it. No, I'm sorry. It's calm. <laughs> hey, 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 it's okay. It's not okay. that hard to use a hammer. Who the fuck is I bet even Zach could use a hammer better than that. Thank you. What do you mean? <laughs> You're welcome, Zach. Thank you. I, I have a lot of I have a lot of faith in your competence. And I guess he was onto something with his complaints here because only a few minutes later, the zombies just kinda open the door normally, despite the barricade being there. Like, normally in these movies, the zombies try to break through the open parts of the door or whatever, but this guy just casually opens it with, like, no resistance at all. Anyway, continuing forward, after the zombies very easily just waltz into this cabin, they proceed to kill literally everyone inside. There are no survivors from the original cast of characters we saw at the start of the movie, with the exception of this one couple who got locked outside amidst the chaos. And it was at this point that I had checked how much time we had left in the film, only to find out we still had over an hour left. Now you may be wondering how the writer of this film intended to dedicate over an hour of screen time to these last two characters. And the answer is quite simple, he didn't. Because after this scene, the movie ends up following a formula that it goes by for the rest of its runtime. It will randomly introduce a brand new set of characters in some random part of town, these characters will get a ton of screen time setting up who they are, and then these last two survivors from the original roster of characters will arrive on scene and all the new characters are eaten by zombies. Sometimes that last part doesn't even happen and we cut straight to the zombies eating these people. Like for example, there's this one scene which sets up this wholesome family making some treats for Halloween when suddenly there's a knock on the door. The young girl in the scene decides to go check it out because she assumes it's trick-or-treaters, and suddenly when she opens the door, she's just eaten by the flesh eater himself. Which like honestly caught me off guard because it's quite rare that you even see children depicted getting killed in these types of movies. But then what follows is even more absurd because one by one each member of the family goes to the door to see what happened and they're just systematically killed off by the zombie who's just chilling there waiting for new victims. <laughs> Damn my god what? Flesh Eater is an optimal killer. <laughs> True. This man, this man will eat somebody, drop their corpse outside, eat the next person who comes out, and look, there's a third one! And just when you thought that scene couldn't get any crazier, it ends with the father coming home to his completely zombie-infected household and just immediately being eaten by everyone else who is also a zombie now. This entire sequence serves no purpose at all and has no consequences to the story. It just happens alongside everything else and we just roll with it. It's only after this that the story properly continues, with our two survivors stumbling into a party being hosted by the worst acted drunk person I have seen in my entire life. That man had never seen what a drunk person acts like in his entire life. I know. This definitely drunk guy in his vampire costume tries to kick the two out for not having costumes, and then you'll never guess what happens next. They hear the stories about the many zombies attacking the people of their small town, and rather than being left in disbelief, they actually all come together and work as a team to fend off the many hordes of undead trying to kill them. 
Nah, I'm just kidding. The zombies just stroll up and eat everybody at the party while the two main characters just find some small pantry in the wall to hide in. And they stay there until the very end of the movie, because after the costume party scene, we suddenly cut to a group of citizens who are armed and tasked with the eradication of all the zombies that have been eating people throughout the movie. Turns out the police put this team together after the death of one of their officers earlier in the movie who was sent to investigate the zombie attack that was happening to our first group of college students. It's also during this scene that we get a very, very brief explanation about where the original zombie came from, with that one explanation being occult rituals and sacrifices that were happening in the forest. Doesn't really make too much sense with how these zombies are depicted to work in the movie, but I suppose it's better than having no explanation at all. After we have their origins explained, we quite literally spend the last 20 minutes of the film just watching these random guys going around and shooting the zombies. It goes on for so long and there's basically nothing else that happens. There's this one part where one of the guys sees that his daughter became a zombie, but any form of drama or emotion that could have been taken from this scene is ruined by how bad the acting here is. Why, why it's a is perfect movie. Like that? They, yeah, they're all doing that. Sake. <laughs> oh shooter, it's my daughter. It goes on and on and on until eventually we cut back to the couple still hiding away in the little pantry they went to after the costume party. They start talking in there about their future and how much they love each other and how they plan to settle down and start a family after all this is over. And by this point, you just know something bad is about to happen. No horror movie has a scene like this that doesn't end with something terrible happening. It's basically a death sentence for the characters involved. And wouldn't you know it, the second they decide to step outside their hiding spot after they hear the gunfire stop, they're immediately shot by a sniper who assumed they were zombies, and the movie just ends after that. This ending, in an attempt to catch the viewer off guard and be unpredictable, ended up being the exact opposite, with all of us who saw it expecting what was going to happen to the point that my friend the baddest literally ended up joking about it mere seconds before the scene actually happened. Now, I think, I still think they're going to be shot by the rednecks and they're because they're going to be like, oh my god, zombies. I That'd be so that fucking so funny. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Oh my god. I'm actually, I'm a genius. Please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so smart. Yay! <laughs> My brain is so big, guys. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> My brain is massive, Zach. This is you don't a great movie. Zach, you don't understand. The power of my brain is not a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> oh. Like I said at the start of this section, this movie leaves a lot to be desired. Its story and structure are next to non-existent, its characters either have no personality at all, or what little they do have is very one-dimensional, and it doesn't really try anything new or interesting with the concept it's working with. The one thing I absolutely will give this movie though, is that at times it has some really surprisingly gnarly special effects. There are points in this movie where you see gore that seems almost too good for the kind of film that it is gore and effects that are done so well in fact that I can't even show the majority of them in this video because they would be way too intense for YouTube's liking. It's actually really off-putting. You have these fantastic looking zombies at parts and some really horrifying deaths shown but they're all sandwiched in the middle of a film which is so painfully mediocre in literally every other way. That was my biggest takeaway from this film and I feel like that says a lot about its overall quality. Hopefully the next one we look at will be a bit more exciting. So we're only on the second film and I'm just letting y'all know now that this next movie jumps the shark hard compared to what we were just talking about. Nightmare City is insane, not quite to the degree of the films we'll be discussing later on, but oh my god nothing could prepare me for the shit that this film pulls. 
This film was originally released in Italy in the year 1980 and was produced by director Umberto Lenzi under the title of that. The title was that. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I just know I'm going to butcher it badly. It was later released for audiences in the US under the title City of the Walking Dead, a title which didn't last that long as it would then be re-released later under the title of Nightmare City, a rough translation of the film's Italian title. Strange production and behind the scenes aside, I was interested in this movie because of the over-the-top premise it had, advertising itself as being an anti-nuclear film about a bunch of irradiated zombies running around the countryside stabbing and shooting people. It sounded like the kind of insane premise that I often enjoyed watching from older exploitation films made around the same time. And actually sitting down and getting into the film, my assumptions were immediately proven correct within the first 10 minutes. The opening of this film shows you everything you need to see to get an idea of what you're about to get into. It opens with our main character, a news journalist who's supposed to be meeting with a scientist at an airport to discuss a recent nuclear accident that took place close by. As he arrives though, he isn't exactly met with the interview he expected as an unidentified military aircraft can be seen flying overhead trying to land at that same airport. It touches down, a bunch of armed soldiers surround it, and suddenly just a bunch of zombies start piling out of it and start stabbing everyone. They just go 1 to 1000 with this shit, I am not kidding. It's just 3 straight minutes of uninterrupted carnage, it caught me so off guard. And I'm just warning you now, this one scene right here pretty well summarizes this entire movie in a nutshell, because this exact scenario plays out so many times. We'll just cut randomly to a group of people minding their own business when suddenly BAM here comes a whole legion of zombies with knives and sickles and guns and whatever the hell else who just start stabbing and murdering everyone who you see on screen. Random scene of a bunch of people in a TV studio filming some aerobics? Sucks to be them because now the zombies are here and everyone is just dead now. Oh hey, here's a bunch of soldiers just standing guard at the city's power supply. I sure hope a whole ass army of zombies doesn't just appear out of some tiny car and start killing everybody. Oh no, those zombies took out the power to the city, trapping a bunch of civilians in an elevator. Hopefully they can find a way out. Oh hey, look, there's hope. Someone's actually helping them using the manual controls for the lift. It would really suck if that person was actually a zombie who was sending all those people down to his fellow zombies so we could see more people get stabbed and murdered. Okay, so I think I got the point across, but I cannot stress enough that this is essentially what the entire movie boils down to. It happens so frequently. And while I'm discussing this element of the movie, I feel like there are two other things related to it that I'd like to bring up. The first being the film's soundtrack, the soundtrack of this movie, more specifically the one that plays when the zombies appear, is insanely catchy. It's so surprisingly upbeat compared to everything else in the movie, and I feel like it perfectly captures the pure chaos that most of its scenes consist of. I ended up enjoying this track so much that I found myself listening to it a lot while working on this video. The same praise cannot be given, however, to the way these zombies look. Out of all the films we're going to be talking about here, and just out of every zombie movie I've seen, this film may have the ugliest designs I have ever seen. Rather than looking rotted or mangled like your traditional zombie would, the ones in this film look more like they have layers of mud piled up on their faces and bodies, which led to me giving them a very fitting name when I saw them over the course of our watch party. Oh, hi. Ah! It's the poop man. Oh god, the poop men are here. <laughs> the poop men? No, there's a whole squad. <laughs> the whole poop squad. <laughs> the whole poop squad. Actually, moving on from this opening and the many scenes like it, this film has simultaneously one of the most simple, yet confusing stories of all time. Allow me to explain. On one hand, you have a very easy to understand simple narrative about radioactive zombies attacking this countryside with the journalist and his wife caught up in the middle of it just trying to survive. There are some decent scenes where we have the origins of these zombies explained to us, with them being the result of the nuclear accident which was mentioned at the start of the film. And there are plenty of tense moments where we question if our two main characters will ever make it out alive. And then on the other hand, we have some of the most bizarre and confusing plot points that just appear in the middle of this film and make absolutely no sense to me. Like, there are several scenes dedicated to this side plot about one of the military generals and his wife who makes a bunch of sculptures. 
Sure, the general himself is a pretty important character, but every now and then it cuts back to his wife who was having these bizarre supernatural experiences. Like every now and then when this one sculpture she's making seemingly starts to foreshadow events that have yet to happen in the movie for no reason at all. The only explanation we get to this is the general at one point just offhandedly mentioning how uncomfortable the statue makes him. Other than that, there's nothing, and the side plot goes actually nowhere. It ends with the general just shooting his wife after she becomes a zombie, and we move forward from it like it's nothing. And if you thought that was weird, just wait until you find out how this thing ends. You see, during the watch party when we were going through this film, I had realized that we were 10 minutes from its conclusion, and I had no idea what was going to happen. It continued going through its regular motions, with hordes of zombies showing up and attacking our two protagonists in a seemingly hopeless situation. It didn't feel like we were at any climax and there was no solution to their current problem. So I found myself beginning to ask just how they intended to wrap this story up with what little time they had left. And I will just say right now that nothing could have ever prepared me for how this film ends. I want you right now to think to yourself how you believe this movie would end. This movie, which is meant to be a commentary about nuclear radiation and the dangers it presents. This movie about surviving an ensuing fallout against a horde of zombies which slaughter everyone in sight. How do you think a film like that would end? Have an idea? Great, now let's talk about why you're probably wrong. As I said before, this film near its end pulls a lot of the same stuff we've been seeing from it since the start. Our two main characters are caught up being chased by a horde of zombies and they're forced to flee to a now abandoned amusement park. It's here we see them fight for their lives as they eventually make their way onto the tracks of a roller coaster, attempting to signal for help to a nearby helicopter. The pilot of the helicopter spots them, the general from before throws them down a rope, and the day is seemingly saved. This is the kind of ending I was expecting one where the protagonists are rescued and flown away to safety. Thing is though, this is not where the movie ends. Instead, we see the wife of our main character struggle to hold onto the rope until she eventually falls to her death in the most Looney Tunes fashion I have ever seen. She dies by just fucking falling, that'll be the funniest ending. That would be really fucking funny. She survives all this and then she fucking falls. Oh my god. Let's <laughs> fucking go! <laughs> and then just when you think that's crazy enough, we then cut to our main character waking up to find out that the entirety of the movie was nothing but a dream. Yeah, you heard that right, this movie pulled a dream ending. Or at least it tries to convince you that it did because after waking up from his dream, the main character tells his wife that he has a meeting to get to. A meeting with a scientist. A meeting at an airport where they would discuss a recent nuclear accident that took place close by. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, it should because that's literally how the movie started. And yeah, this goes exactly where you'd expect from here. He arrives, an unidentified military aircraft lands there, and the movie ends with the events that it started with happening all over again. This movie just pulled the infinite loop ending for literally no reason. I could not tell you a single plot point in this entire film that either warranted this or foreshadowed it. It just happened out of completely nowhere and left me legitimately speechless. The door open, it's gonna- oh, imagine, watch, you're gonna be right, Spidey, the door's gonna open and it's gonna cut to credits right away. Oh, come the Oh my fuck fucking on. god. Without uh, oh, you were come so right. On! <laughs> that was truly the movie of all time. That see that movie wasn't it wasn't that bad until it used the cop out ending. That movie wasn't that bad until it had what may be the most garbage ending I've ever seen in a film. This ending actually took so much away from the enjoyment I originally had when watching this film. It wasn't the best thing on the planet leading up to it, but it was just an overall enjoyable zombie movie with a great soundtrack and some really high energy scenes up until the ending, which really just felt like the writers and director not knowing how to actually wrap the whole thing up. And this is coming from somebody who doesn't mind this kind of ending in media. 
It just felt like this one did it for no conceivable reason, and it vexes me so much to even think about. Fortunately, the next film we'll be talking about here delivers a lot better than this one on both its ending as well as presentation in general. So let's take a look at that one next. Night of the Comet is, without a doubt, the most successful and well-known film we'll be talking about in this whole video. And that's not surprising to me in the slightest because it was easily the best one we watched. Was it campy? Oh yeah, insanely. Was the acting the best? No, not necessarily. But this film absolutely delivered in so many different ways. Its story was genuinely really interesting to me. Its characters were very well done, and the actual cinematography of the film was legitimately beautiful at times. If there was a single film in this entire video that I would suggest any of you guys go check out for yourselves, it would absolutely be this one because it definitely deserves it. With all that praise in mind, I will say that I plan on going a bit more in depth on the recap and the story of this particular movie compared to the others because it actually feels like there's a real plot worth discussing here. So don't be surprised if we stay at this film for quite a bit longer. To give some background to this movie, Night of the Comet was released in the year 1984 and was both directed and written by Tom Eberhardt. There isn't too much crazy production stuff to talk about with this one compared to the others, but something I found extremely interesting is just how successful this film was despite the fact that I hear nobody talk about it. Like, this film was made with a budget of $700,000 and ended up grossing over $14 million at the US box office. This film was a massive success, and yet despite that, it's so obscure nowadays that I was able to watch the entire thing on YouTube. I don't know, it's just such a weird thing to see for a movie like this. I've never seen anything like it. Actually getting into the plot, Night of the Comet opens with exactly what the title promises. The night where a massive comet will be passing by the Earth for the first time in 65 million years. We see the entirety of the city takes place in getting ready for the event, with people gathering outside and several stores selling merchandise dedicated to it. And it's here where we meet the first of our two main characters, Regina, who we see obsessively playing on the arcade machine rather than doing her actual job. We see her trying to beat the high score of every other player who was on the leaderboard, only to be spited by someone who took her 6th place spot with the initials DMK. Now, this may seem like a random arbitrary thing to bring up, but I promise I'm doing it for a reason. You'll see later. Anyway, after meeting Regina, we're also greeted by several other characters, the most important of which being our other main character, Sam, Regina's sister who is left at home while their mother prepares a whole party for the event. We see people gathering outside and celebrating, there's a bit of a fight between Sam and her mother, and next thing you know we see the comet begin to pass by overhead. And then everyone dies. I'm not joking, this isn't a bit I'm doing. This movie spends the first 10 minutes setting up this whole city and its characters only to kill almost all of them just as quickly as they were introduced. Why does this remind me of I Have No Mouth and I Wait, are they already all dead? Yeah. <laughs> What the fuck? I glanced down at my mind of like Cookie Run Kingdom for like a split second of their art. <laughs> like, awesome. This movie demands your full attention, average. I was looking the whole time I and I still don't understand. Yeah, I was like, I was glancing at it. I, I was like looking at it. I only looked out for like a split second. I, did they Bro, all why die? are all of these shots like fucking god tier? Yeah, Jesus I know these Christ. shots are fantastic. I was really expecting, you know, more like explosion, not just like so a all big of, purple all of the wave. people are gone, but like nothing else is. That's interesting. Like this was what immediately hooked me on this movie. For the most part, it's very over the top and goofy, but these quiet moments where the camera pans around a completely dead city are genuinely haunting. Especially when we see the remains of the people, which consist only of their clothes and bits of red dust, which now float around and pollute the air. It was a great start to what turned out to be a great movie. Moving on, we see that miraculously both Regina and her boyfriend, who she was spending the night with, ended up surviving the whole event. This is later revealed to have been possible because they were staying in a building made of steel which the radiation of the comet couldn't get through, but for now it's just treated as a bizarre coincidence. Regina's boyfriend heads out to try and sell a pirated film reel only to be attacked by the first zombie of the whole film, and he's never seen again. 
Regina soon wakes up herself and begins walking around the store they were sleeping in, looking for her boyfriend or anyone really, and it's here that she discovers the horrifying situation she finds herself in. She finds clothing scattered everywhere and nobody else in sight and immediately assumes the worst. And it's here where she has her first encounter with a zombie herself, the same zombie who killed her boyfriend. A zombie that my friend Ordinarily Average gave a very good nickname to. He's like a nice guy, he like sees a mage like, oh, then he sees like her, he's like, oh, hey, yeah, do you want to get coffee? Yeah. I never understood why they always go for the Leon S. Kennedy rejects and not me. The like, Forgotten really Mario Brother. <laughs> the Here that I'd like to talk about how the zombies in this film actually work because I find it very interesting compared to what we've already seen. See, the zombies in this film aren't a result of reanimation or some kind of infection. Instead, they're what happened to the few people who survived the initial passing of the comet. The comet polluted the air of the entire planet, killing most people instantly, but like I said before, some people managed to survive because they were inside a building that had some kind of steel or metal walls. These people, the ones who leave the safety of wherever they're hiding, then get exposed to the polluted air and start to rot away slowly. It drives them mad, decays their skin, and turns them into the zombies we see through the movie. This explanation of how the zombies work in this film is so cool to me. It basically puts a massive looming threat over our main characters, with us wanting to see them figure their way out of what seems like a hopeless situation. And it makes the zombies themselves very interesting because rather than being completely mindless monsters, there's still small semblances of humanity left in them. Regina ends up fighting off this initial zombie and rides away on her motorcycle, making her way through the city and trying to get home to her sister. And it's here as she does this that I feel the need to comment on how legitimately beautiful this film is, seriously. The shot composition of these scenes, the color grading, the set pieces, they're all so well put together and act as an amazing spectacle to look at. In my opinion, it's these visuals that are easily the strongest part of this movie. They really sell the desolate feeling of the abandoned city and put into perspective the situation all of our characters find themselves in. Genuinely some top tier stuff. Anyway, moving on, Regina ends up finding Sam and the two of them make their way to a radio station to seek out cover where they meet this guy named Hector, a truck driver who ends up accompanying them for most of the movie. A couple of important things happen here, with the main thing being the introduction of these scientist characters who appear to be monitoring the whole situation from an underground bunker. They talk about taking in survivors with this one lady arguing against it to the dismay of her colleagues and then it just kind of cuts away from them for quite a while in the movie after. I promise they'll be very important later though. The other thing which happens in this radio station, and easily one of the weirdest things in this movie, is this sequence where Sam is seen driving away and being pursued by cops. As she's pulled over, it turns out these cops are actually zombie cops, or as we called them during the watch party, ZOPS. Why are there cops? Please be zombie cops. Please! Please be zombie cops. They gotta be. Please. Please be zops. I'm begging you, please be zombies. Please. Oh, they're 100% zombies. And then she wakes up because it turns out the whole sequence was a nightmare. She gets up, goes to the washroom to refresh herself, and then the zops come back because it turns out she was having a dream within a dream. And then she wakes up. Yeah, this whole sequence was weird as hell and it gets no real elaboration. It just kind of happens and we're supposed to roll with it. Shortly after that, some other random stuff happens, like Hector going back home to be chased by some zombie kid, more stuff with the scientists and them taking in survivors and the same lady from before still being very against it, and then Regina and Sam leaving the radio station and finally having the reality of their situation set in. There's this heartfelt moment between the two of them where they express how scared they are of their situation, and shortly after that, we get a shopping montage. Yeah, so I guess to make themselves feel better, they decided to run over to some random mall and start grabbing whatever they could. You know, to take the edge off of what is very clearly a miserable situation to be caught up in. The montage itself is decently fun with them running around to some upbeat music and trying on clothes and whatnot. But it's here that the movie hits its peak. 
because it's in these scenes where we get introduced to the greatest character in all of cinema. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Willy. Willy is this goofy fella who randomly shows up and starts watching both Regina and Sam on the security cameras. And let me tell you that this guy right here is easily the most entertaining character I have ever seen in one of these films in a very long time. Let me tell you the lore of Willy and his gang, cause these guys got a whole backstory that gets explained in this movie and I live for it. You see, Willy and his gang were just a bunch of minimum wage workers who once worked for this mall. And after the comet passed, they were seemingly the only survivors of their entire staff. Coming to this revelation, Willy decided that the only reasonable course of action was to take over the mall as its new corrupt owner and kill any and everyone who tries to steal from it. He is the leader of an evil mall gang who tries to rule over said mall like some ridiculous king and I adore this so fucking much. Willy's inclusion leads to easily the most entertaining fight sequence we get to see from any of the movies in this video. With his henchmen trying to kill both Regina and Sam and them participating in cartoony hijinks in order to escape. We see stuff like Regina pretending to be a mannequin, Sam just throwing whatever the hell she can find at the guys carrying machine guns, and all the while Willy is talking to them through the mall speakers like he's Jigsaw or something. This entire sequence comes to its climax as Willy and Regina manage to take two people hostage, with Regina having one of Willy's henchmen and Willy having Sam. The two argue for a moment, which eventually leads to the single funniest scene I have witnessed in a very long time. I'm sorry, him. miss. I can't have you holding one of my people hostage. Even if you pull the trigger, I can still take him out. I love can't him. You? Come on, Willie. She means it. Miss, you're not getting the point. Willie, come I on. can't have you holding one of my people hostage. Wow. Oh, so he just kills him. Oh, I love him. You're crazy. I'm not crazy. I just don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's honestly bait. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Literally <laughs> same. <laughs> that has to go with the that has to That's go with right. that has to go with the video. <laughs> that has to go with <laughs> The base oh levels are off oh the charts. Oh, this guy! Oh, I need this... that clip to just reply to people <laughs> whenever they call me out for my this guy, atrocities. This guy is my new favorite villain ever. <laughs> I just, I just can't properly put into words how much I love this guy. He is so ridiculous. If there's one takeaway I want people to have from this video, it's that we are seriously underrating Willy. He is the greatest villain in all of fiction, okay? Anyway, actually moving on with the plot, Willy manages to capture both Regina and Sam, revealing to the two of them that he is actually a zombie and tormenting them before straight up trying to kill them. This doesn't end up happening though, because the most tragic death in all of cinema happens as the team working for the scientists from earlier shoot Willy and his gang, killing all of them. Rest in peace, Willy. We'll never forget you. After this heart-wrenching death scene ends, Regina is brought to the scientist bunker as a survivor and Sam is kept back because she was showing signs of slowly becoming a zombie herself. Her and the scientist lady we've been seeing through the movie talk for a bit, and in one of the most shocking scenes we get from the whole film, she just straight up euthanizes her, and then shoots the guy who came there with her. Like, okay, this just happened out of nowhere, what the hell? And just when you thought that this series of events couldn't get any more grim, Hector comes back in a Santa costume, which I genuinely, for the life of me, can't remember the context to, and the lady who's been doing all this just straight up euthanizes herself as well in front of him. She talks about how every survivor is going to die anyways, and then just drifts off before we can get any further context. And it's after this moment that the film reaches its climax. 
We cut back to Regina in the scientist bunker who is now slowly but surely learning the truth about the situation that all the survivors find themselves in. Turns out these guys were never the good guys in the story. Instead, they've been collecting survivors to harvest their blood and create serums that will prevent the effects of the comet's pollution. The lady who didn't want any survivors brought down there? It turns out it's because she didn't want them to be killed by her colleagues. She was the good guy. Now with that in mind, you may be wondering why she would go and kill Sam then. Well, turns out she didn't because Hector shows up to the lab and has Sam chilling in his trunk. Yeah, it turns out the stuff she used on Sam just knocked her out, and the real euthanasia she was carrying was the stuff she used on herself. Which, like, I don't know why she went out of her way to do such an elaborate plan to trick her colleague when she just shot him immediately after anyways, but whatever, it's still a neat twist. Hector and Sam end up meeting up with Regina again, they escape the lab with a pair of children who are being kept there, the lab is blown up along with all the scientists, and they ride off to freedom. Now, with the setup of this movie and how dire their situation is, you may be wondering how all of our characters actually end up surviving this whole apocalypse in the end. And the answer turns out to be more simple than you'd expect, because in the next scene, it starts to rain and said rain quite literally just washes all the red mist out of the air. All they had to do was wait for it to rain for the zombie apocalypse to be over. I would complain about this, but honestly with how random everything else in the movie is a lot of the time, I don't really mind this little plot convenience. Besides, I ended up loving all these characters so much that I wanted any excuse I could get to see an ending that wasn't them just dying. After the rain settles and the red mist vanishes, the movie ends with us seeing Regina and Hector now together and raising the two kids they saved from the lab as a newly adopted family. We get some morbidly comedic scenes of them all together taking photos and walking around as seemingly the last people on earth. We then see Sam at a traffic light, bummed out over the fact that there isn't really anyone left for her to get with, when suddenly out of nowhere we see a car come driving up that almost runs her over. The guy driving the car apologizes, he and Sam immediately fall in love with each other, and then she hops in the car and drives away with him. The last thing we see is a license plate on the back of his car reading DMK, the same initials on the arcade game that beat one of Regina's high scores. See, I told you that would come up again later. The movie ends after that, with Regina and Hector playing catch out in the street with their newly adopted kids as the camera pans away, bringing an end to what is easily the best film out of the entire watch party. This film absolutely blew me away. Night of the Comet was a movie that we ended up watching because the idea of a bunch of valley girls fighting zombies was something so ridiculous that we expected it to be a so bad it's good kind of situation. But upon watching it, we were instead greeted by a legitimately competent film. One with a well-written story, fantastic cinematography, and of course easily the best element of the film, Willy. I'm not crazy, I just don't give a fuck. All jokes aside though, this movie is great. I went into it expecting something ironically enjoyable that wouldn't exactly be too good, but ended up finding an actual underrated gem that way more people need to check out. The same cannot be said, however, for the next and final film in this entire video. So let's go check that one out next. <laughs> Oh my god, this movie. How do I even start with this movie? How do I even describe the experience that is watching this? Out of all the films we've watched on this little marathon, The Video Dead is without a shadow of a doubt the most ridiculous movie on here. There is no competition. And with that said, it is easily my favorite as well. Is this movie good? No. God, no. This film is a dumpster fire, but my goodness is it the most enjoyable dumpster fire I have ever witnessed. The Video Dead has some of the worst acting, the dumbest writing, and the goofiest special effects I have ever seen. This film is truly a sight to behold. I wasn't even able to find out much about the behind the scenes of this movie beforehand. All I was able to gather was that it was written, produced, and directed by Robert Scott and got released direct to video in 1987. Other than that, I have nothing. I wasn't even able to find out the budget this film was made for, which is so unfortunate because I want to know that info so badly. Apparently it was planned to have a sequel too, but it got cancelled because the director was offered the same budget as the first one, which he didn't want to work with again, leading me to become even more curious about what the hell this movie was made for. 
This whole movie is an enigma. Its story, the actors, the behind the scenes, all of it's a mystery to me and it leaves me just wanting to know how the hell this whole thing came to be. And speaking of its story, I'm gonna try my best to describe the plot of this film to you to the best of my abilities, but I feel like no matter what I do, I won't be able to make up for the fever dream this film is, so please bear with me here. The Video Dead is a zombie movie all about an evil television that acts as a gateway to a whole other world, which is an infinitely repeating zombie film. This television, when turned on, allows for the zombies in said zombie movie to climb out of their world and into the human world to wreak havoc and do their whole zombie thing. The movie opens up with an older guy who is so lazy he can't even take care of a goldfish waking up to a delivery at his doorstep. The delivery is exactly what you'd expect. The TV, which was mysteriously sent his way by someone who remains unnamed for the time being. He takes the TV into his house, it does some spooky stuff like turning on by itself, the zombies escape, and the poor old man is killed, giving us our cold open. We then cut to our two protagonists, Zoe and her brother Jeff, who may have the crowning achievement of being the worst acted character I have ever seen in a movie. Like, not to throw shade at this guy, I'm sure he wasn't given much for his role, and judging by the fact that this is the only film he's ever played in, I'm sure he's doing his best. But my god, I don't think you could get this guy to act to save his life. Every single line he says comes out like an unenthusiastic theater student, and it makes for a lot of the scenes that aren't meant to be funny being absolutely hilarious as a result. Sure. I love animals. <laughs> Me too, but I <laughs> Funny you should say that. I hate poodles too. Oh, this is the worst acting yet. I know. <laughs> I don't get it. Why are you leaving? <laughs> Why did you kill her? <laughs> this is the worst acting I've ever seen. We find out after meeting these two that they inherited the house from the previous owner after he mysteriously went missing. And it's not long after that we're introduced to Mr. Daniels, a man who was always seen wearing a goofy cowboy hat and was apparently the person the TV was supposed to go to at the start. Yeah, so you'd think from the opening that the TV was meant to go to the guy at the start because of some kind of supernatural circumstances or something, but no, turns out it was just a genuine mistake made by the delivery guys. Which is just so unfortunate for the poor guy and his dead goldfish, like how bad can your luck be? Anyways, Jeff dismisses Mr. Daniels and immediately finds the TV in the attic, bringing it downstairs like he wasn't just warned about something evil matching its description and putting it in his bedroom. It's then that we meet another side character, April, who we see out walking her dog when she runs into Jeff. The two characters immediately get along, and her dog ends up escaping into the woods only to get killed by the zombies from the opening who are still roaming about. <laughs> that was very <laughs> a man's voice. <laughs> that was a man going, <laughs> Jeff and April end up finding the dog, and April is left distraught because of what her parents will do once they find out it's dead. But don't worry though, Jeff comes up with a foolproof plan to make sure April doesn't get in any trouble. The dog swallowed a ball. Mm -hmm. You were walking the dog on the leash, and some total jerk threw the ball to the dog, and he accidentally swallowed it. All we have to do is push the ball down the dog's throat. Uh, They'll never know the difference. What? That is really sick. Yeah, that man is, this man is insane. And somehow this works? Because next time April talks to Jeff, her family is perfectly fine with that explanation to the point that they don't even seem to care that the dog is dead. Good job, Jeff, you absolute genius. Speaking of Jeff being a genius, right after that phone call with April, he finally decides to plug in the haunted TV and see what's playing. He gets really invested in the zombie movie that's playing, the TV seems to break for a minute, and next thing you know, a whole woman just climbs out of the TV and seduces him. They make out for a bit in classic horror movie fashion before she's randomly sent back into the TV. Jeff seems very distraught over this, but he doesn't have too much time to think about it because without any warning, this suddenly happens. How do I get in touch with you? <laughs> Just jerk Just off, I don't know. With you. No. <sighs> Why did 
did you kill her? <laughs> you don't know. This is the worst acting I've ever seen. This random guy who just materializes into the movie is named The Garbage Man. I am not joking. They call me The Garbage Man. <laughs> and he exists purely in this film as a source of exposition on how the zombies work. After this initial scene where he's introduced, he never comes back. We never know who he is, how he got into the TV world, what he's even doing there. All we know is he calls himself the Garbage Man and he kills zombies just for fun, I guess? Good old Garbage Man explains to Jeff that the zombies are from another world and they have a couple weaknesses, their main one being mirrors. He tells Jeff to strap a mirror to the front of the TV and just leave it somewhere that people won't find it. Jeff is very quick to follow this advice, leaving the TV in the basement with a mirror taped to the front and locking the door. And it's at this point that we just completely and totally abandon anything to do with Jeff or Zoe or April and just start watching a montage of the zombies killing random people in their neighborhood. Remember at the start of this video when I talked about Flesh Eater and how that film just transformed into a compilation of people being introduced, the main characters arriving, and then zombies showing up and killing them all? Yeah, this film does that, but never has any of the main characters involved. It just devolves into 10 minutes of the zombies killing random nobodies for quite literally no reason. It's the closest I've ever seen to a movie having legitimate filler, and so many of the deaths shown in this sequence feel like something right out of a cartoon. After the random death montage is finally over, we cut back to April who stumbles across multiple of the bodies that were left behind in the zombies wake, and she ends up spending the night in Jeff and Zoe's house to keep herself safe. Mr. Daniels comes back and offers to help them now that they understand the threat they're facing, and they try coming up with a plan. Mr. Daniels explains to them that there are multiple ways to defeat the zombies, with the mirrors being the main one because I guess the zombies just hate looking at themselves and being reminded that they're dead. The other ways include not showing your fear of them and trapping them in a space they can't escape from. I couldn't tell you why those are ways to defeat zombies, but I mean, hey, it works later on, so who am I to judge their methods? While they're all kept up in the living room planning out how to defeat the zombies, April actually ends up getting kidnapped, which leads to the film's climax as Mr. Daniels and Jeff leave into the forest to try and save her. While wandering through the forest to save her, the two get involved with a bunch of random hijinks like shooting zombies with a bow and arrow or calling each other names for a ridiculously long time. Jesus Christ. Don't you ever sneak up on me like that again. I didn't sneak up on you, boy. You sneak up on me like that again, you know what's gonna happen to you? No, boy. You tell me. Death and destruction. <laughs> okay, boy. Whatever you say. And that's another thing. Literally the least threatening boy, thing ever. Jeff, think he can handle that? Okay, a boy. Gust of wind <laughs> could kill Jeff. Real. Go ahead, have your fun. I'm confident any one of us could beat the shit out of him. You call me. I called you cow shit. You call me boy. I call you cow shit. Okay, cow shit. And at the end of it, the two of them finally arrive at this cabin in the woods where their main plan to defeat the zombies and save April can be executed. There's only one problem with this plan though. That being the fact that when Mr. Daniels goes into said cabin to plot it out, he finds April already dead. Of course, he doesn't think to tell this to Jeff, instead going forward with the plan as if it never happened. What is the plan you ask? Well, it's a doozy. The entirety of their plan to defeat the zombies involves Jeff being strung up in some trees as bait, all the while Mr. Daniels waits inside the cabin to kill them off using his bow and arrow one by one. Surely nothing about this plan could go wrong at all. So anyways, the plan goes wrong almost immediately because somehow Mr. Daniels manages to fall asleep while the zombies are trying to kill Jeff. Like, dude, this was your plan! You came up with it! How the hell did you manage to fall asleep? He's woken up by the sounds of Jeff screaming and manages to just barely save him, killing the zombies and saving the day. Except he doesn't, because none of the zombies are killed, and I kid you not, both Mr. Daniels and Jeff both die shortly after. And it's here that the real climax of the movie begins, as Zoe is hunted down as the film's final girl. And this climax is insane! It starts off exactly like you'd expect, with the zombies starting to break down the door and Zoe grabbing a weapon to defend herself, but it goes in a completely different direction as she suddenly has a flashback to one of the zombies weaknesses, that being fear or lack thereof. So she just goes outside and greets them, has dinner with them, shakes hands with them, feeds them beans, 
Also that she can work towards a plan to exploit the zombies' other big weakness, that being to trap them in a room they can't escape from. So under the guise of friendly hospitality, she takes the zombies down to the basement, locks them down there, and the film reaches its end as they're all sucked back into the TV once and for all. This climax is insanity. This film pulls a lot of absurd stuff, but something about seeing a bunch of killer zombies sat around a table eating beans and just chatting it up with this poor girl was so ridiculously goofy to me, and I loved it. The film finally comes to an end as we see Zoe's parents coming to visit her at a psych ward, where she's been left as a result of the trauma she experienced from the zombies and everyone else she knows being dead. Her parents seem worried for her, but they're doing their best to make sure she's comfortable during her time there. In fact, they even brought her a gift to help pass the time. No. It's gonna be a new TV. It's gonna be a new TV. Yeah, it's going to be. It's a new TV. You're, you're so right. It's the same one. It's the same TV. And so, the movie ends as it cuts to black and Zoe screams out in horror, bringing an end to both my favorite film we ended up watching and the zombie movie marathon. The Video Dead is by far one of the campiest and most ridiculous films I have ever watched. Its story feels like a fever dream sewn together by a bunch of really bizarre, loose ideas. It has some of the worst acting I have ever seen, and its behind the scenes is a complete mystery to me, leaving me both confused and very intrigued about this movie. It may be a dumpster fire, but I'd be lying to you if I said that movies like this one weren't some of my favorites to watch. I've always had a strong love for cheesy 80s horror films, and this one checks off every single box for why I love them so dearly. If you're looking for goofy fun, go check this one out. If you're looking for a genuinely good film, maybe consider something else. All of the films we ended up watching for this video had a bizarre charm to them that made them all really fun to watch. Even films which felt more lacking had parts of them that me and my many co-hosts were able to get a lot of fun out of, making this easily one of the most enjoyable videos I've ever sat down to make. If you want to check out any of the films we talked about today, then you're in luck because they are all very easy to find online. And if you want to see the full version of our watch party that we recorded to make this video, I'll be posting it on both my Patreon as well as on my channel for any channel members to check out, so be looking forward to that. I hope that all of you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. As I said at the start, zombie movies have always been something I am very passionate about, so having the opportunity to experience brand new ones alongside my friends and viewers has been a very special experience for me. I hope to see you in whatever my next project ends up being. Goodbye for now. I'm not crazy, I just don't give a fuck!